All right. Well, I'm going to introduce you to uh, the most thrilling story, history story, it could be a movie, of Sir Isaac Newton solving a problem of who is really at fault for 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 to 8, having a distorted reference to the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and the, and the, and they're all one. So it sounds exactly like the Trinity. Where did that come from? Okay, I'm going to just get to the punch so you can understand where it's all going. So um, this was in no Greek manuscripts. It was in no Latin versions other than the 405 A.D. Jerome Vulgate. And that's going to be important. Not not in, not in what they call the there was other lineages. The Ethiopic uh, Vulgate, so that's Latin even older. In all the manuscripts, he, he had ex ex accessible in uh, Latin in the Italian areas. All of them had not that not the, not those words. And all the Greek manuscripts, and they were just marginal notes. And he's going to go through, Sir Isaac Newton is going to go through all that. So how he's figured it out, he he puts all the evidence together and he tells you that while indeed... Uh, Erasmus relied upon being handed a translation of what was the Latin Vulgate, but he was told this is a Greek manuscript. You said you wanted a Greek manuscript, or you wouldn't put these words back in the Father, the Word, and the and the Spirit are one. And so that's that's why he that's why Erasmus did it. But the ultimate fraud was Jerome's, and this is so interesting because if you remember in our last video we were asking. Why didn't Jer Jerome put back in the Bible? Uh, no, no, not to, excuse me. Why did he take out of the Bible this day of begotten, which was in every manuscript of Greek, every manuscript of Latin that we know of, and there's no mention of any missing it. And and eight Latin uh, earlier Vulgates had it, no mention of anybody not being in any of them. He also knew it was in the Ebionite Bible. Epiphanius quotes it in 375, this day of Begani. Well, it c c contradicted, I showed you, the Nicene Creed, the Eternal Son Doctrine, that arises out of claiming, or the Creed saying, Jesus is begotten, not made. So if you're not made, you're eternal. If you're begotten, you would be finite in time. So we're supposed to accept this only by accepting the idea of a contradiction, which is he's in the, the Eternal Son. But uh, Augustine and, and a guy named... Um, Faustus, another bishop, they were fighting over this, and Faustus is saying you can't be a Catholic if you uh, if you accept what Matthew teaches, which Jesus and Luke teaches that Jesus was begotten at his baptism. Anyway, long story short, he's going to show us that Jerome was a, a very corrupt person. He was willing to add this verse in at 1 John 5, verses 7 to 8. So we're going to go through the whole story and how he solves it. But we're also going to see how it was all set up on Erasmus too. Okay, so there we go. So what what's changed in 1 John 5, verses 7 to 8 that's not been there before? Five changes. The word Father. The words the Word are added. The word Holy and the word One. Five changes of adding words. How many was taken away to, to, to make this fraud work? But before we go there, let's remember why we're doing all this. Because Jesus said in John 17, 1 to 3, the Father, he, he dressed the Father in prayer in front of the apostles. And he said, Father, you are the only true God. So even though Jesus said, the Father dwells in me, and if you see me, you've seen the Father, all these things are because the Father dwells in him. It doesn't mean he's God. <laughs> okay, there's a big difference. And to he's, what did he say right here? Literally, explicitly, the Father is the only true God. That's all you need to know. Jesus left a message for us. That's what we need to follow. But let's go on now. Okay. And uh, so as far as we know, this is how the King James reads today. So I'm just going to read you the verse 7. Verse 7 is the verse that was never there. It's a phantom verse. Except there, it's in the Latin Vulgate only of 405 AD, but none of the earlier Latin Vulgates and none of the other nations, the much earlier and older versions from Ethiopia and others, they don't have it either. They... they don't have it. Um, and no, there's no Greek manuscripts. Everybody knows that. That supports it. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, 
Now, it sounds like Jesus, right? The Father, words, or Son would normally be what we think, but the Word and the Holy Ghost. There you go. Three. And these three are one. Boom. Got the Trinity. This is right there in the King James Bible. So it's it's over. It's the proof positive. And this would have been in a... And what, um, um, Sir Isaac Newton's going to say is if this was in there earlier with all these debates going on and you got all these people fighting with the Arians trying to prove that there, there's a trinity, they use they use the um, the verse where Jesus says, I am the Father are one, which, by the way, since Jesus said he wanted us to be one like he is with the Father, it didn't mean by nature that they had fused into one being but with two personalities. No. <laughs> It meant it was unity of mind, but, you know, it's an argument. Well, if you're going to argue uh, the Father and, and Jesus are one from that, wouldn't you use this to prove that all three are one? This would have been your home run ticket all along. And he's saying, hey, this is never used. It's evidence that it did not exist. Until when? You're going to find out. It existed, in, in, other than in the Vulgate, it only existed in the Erasmus version. And then the verse 8, and there are three that bear witness in earth and the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Okay. Now, some people are going to misread the quotation of this and claim, oh, that see, through the three are one. And they're going to say that the verse 7, that the way we see it now, is was always there. But they're, they're ignoring the fact that verse 8 has the same language, except it's about the spirit, the water, and the blood, which isn't the Father, Word, and uh, Spirit, okay? So it's clearly not the same thing. And so you, you've got to not let people distort that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you. That's the other side of the argument, telling you that the Father's talked about the three agree in one. But you can see in context, verse 8 has nothing to do with the Trinity. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so... The, the only true verse is verse 8. So by comparison, so basically whoever was committing this fraud, it was probably Jerome, we're going to find out in the end, um, that he basically saw the verse the way it really reads and then said, you know what, wouldn't it be nice if it said this? Because <laughs> it sounds like it's close, but it doesn't, it's no cigar, unfortunately. And you just, by temptation, by sinful decision that you're going to change the the Bible, he did this. Or somebody did it. And it could just have been the, well, it, we'll, we'll get there. So to get to the fraudulent thing, you have to add how many words? Father, the word, that's three, holy, four. And to get to the Trinity, you have to add one. Five. Five fraudulent words added, right? Now we're going to have to ask how many words do you have to take out of the, the true verse to basically rewrite this, just to see the, the mental process. So if you're inspired by verse 8 to make up verse 7, you have to basically delete the words water and the blood and in agreement. And that's six words. So you've, you've added five and you've taken out six, and then you've created a whole new verse that was never there. Now we have to know something. How important was this verse when the King James revealed it for the first time in history? It would never existed. No, nobody, uh, well, I guess it was in the Latin Vulgate, but nobody really paid attention to that after 405, interestingly enough. So this is when it first emerges into culture again, because the Greek manuscripts didn't have it. So whatever was going on didn't, didn't perpetuate what was in the Latin Vulgate. So Milton... He was an English poet in the uh, 1600s. And he says, uh, 1 John 5, verses 7 to 8 is the clearest foundation for the received doctrine of the essential unity of three persons. So this was a big boost to that whole idea that we've got a verse now on Trin Trinity and we're going to use it. But I think I've shown you that it, it depended on having on five additions and six subtractions from the actual verse, verse 8. Um Okay, but Erasmus is a, a he's not a Protestant, but he's not quite a Catholic either. He's a Christian, and he is trying to create a Bible that uh, is in Greek, and he's trying to make the best manuscript for that, and he's trying to make a, a better version of the Latin Bible at the same time. So um, in 1516, he's going to come out with a New Testament in Greek, 
and uh, Goldstone explains in his book, uh, Out of the Flames, this passage was generally cited as biblical justification of the Trinity. That's afterwards. But the original Greek manuscripts from which Erasmus worked lacked this verse entirely, and so he omitted it from the translation. So he does not put it in the Bible in 1516, his first edition, nor his second edition in 1519. And he's going to come out one with another in 1522. He had a lot of corrections he had to make, and he, so he couldn't just leave it the way he had left it in 1519. Okay, so after 1516 and 19 editions, people notice, hey, this verse is gone from what they wanted there because they, they knew about the Latin Vulgate and they wanted this put in there uh, in Greek. <laughs> they wanted the Greek in there. And um, so, uh, so because it was lacking also in what's called the Syriac, Arabic, Ethiopic, basically those are other kinds of Latin Vulgates, uh, as well as the greater part of the ancient Greek manuscripts. So basically the Latin and the Greek manuscripts all don't have it unless you count just one manuscript, the 405 a Jerome edition of the Vulgate. So basically the Vulgate is all by itself with nothing, nothing. There are, there are quotes of verse 8, which is the true verse, with the three are one, but it's blood and water and spirit not a trinity of Father, Word, and Spirit. So this is why Erasmus does not include it. He, but he's under pressure. He's being claiming that he's not perpetuating that single reference in history, which was the Jerome Vulgate Bible. And Mr. Uh, Hall Harris III wrote a book. He's a professor at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, I think in this since the 70s with the time he wrote this book and he taught New Testament Greek. So, I mean, he, this guy knows this stuff and he did a very detailed in-depth uh, review of everything about John and include the, including this passage. And he says, specialist Protestant scholars have elucidated that the manuscript evidence is, quote, decidedly against the authenticity of verse 7 Explaining these words in 1 John 5, verses 7 to 8, only appear in eight very late manuscripts, the earliest of which is from the 10th century, but it is there only a marginal note. And that's, and you're going to find out who was the person who pointed that out first. And that would be, well, I'm going to presume it, it was uh, Sir Isaac Newton. And he's going to tell you where he found the marginal notes. And he have found three or four and, you know, red books where they were mentioned as well. I mean, the guy, Sir Isaac Newton was a genius and he was a sleuth. He was not going to let this go. I really think this could be a great movie if you just knew how to put it together. It's like uh, one of those um, brown movies about, you know, uh, archaeologists. Okay, anyway. Hence, one Christian scholar put it this way, there is no sure evidence of this reading in any Greek manuscript until what? The 1500s. And what is the Greek manuscript? It was the one made to order when you'll see Erasmus is going to say to his friend, this colleague, this Catholic scholar saying, hey, you got to put it in to your Greek New Testament that it was there. And he's going to say, show me a manuscript or else I'm not going to put it in. There is no manuscripts in Greek. And one pro is produced. And we'll see where it really came from. Okay, and um, this is just an overview. We're going to get into this in a little more detail later. But Erasmus offers to put back the words deleted from the verse. You know, this guy's claiming you've deleted, and he's saying it's not even there. If one could produce a Greek text with these words, you know, the Father, the Word, and and the Spirit are one. The Trinitarian par Trinitarian party rep was a Catholic scholar named Stunica who obviously was schooled in pious frauds. <laughs> he submitted to Erasmus a Greek text dated 1520, which purportedly was more ancient, and Erasmus accepted it. Which makes me kind of wonder, was Erasmus fooled or just went along because he was getting a lot of heat for this. That is the story. Anyway, it was one more pious fraud or a fraud to which Erasmus suspected and still consented. We don't know. It would never have been uncovered unless, however, Sir Isaac Newton spoke up in 1690. So this is going to sit dead from 1522 when Erasmus puts it in until Mr. Sir Isaac Newton bashes it and crashes it. And that's when people found out this was a fraud. I want to read a couple of segments from uh, 
Professor Harris, uh, he, again, Dallas Theological Seminary professor, uh, because it's, it's just he did very good work on how thorough he did this is very good. He's a, he's a little sleuth of himself. And he says, these words known as the comma Johannanim, Latin for joining sentence, are inserted between verses 7 and 8 and read as follows. Boom, 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 boom. In heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. That's inside of 5.7. Then in 5.8, it says, and there are three that testify on earth. So that's the way it was then. Now it's all in verse 7. So they've been rearranging these verses around. Although the words are fairly well known in the English-speaking world, primarily through their inclusion in the King James Version manuscript and contextual evidence, is decidedly against the authentic their authenticity. I'm not sure that sentence was punctuated properly, but anyway, he's saying the contextual evidence is against their authenticity. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, and then he says the longer reading, the one with this verse, is found only in eight late manuscripts, four of which have the words in a marginal note. Most of these manuscripts, gives the numbers and minor variations, originate from the 16th century, the earliest manuscript codex, 221, is from the 10th century, which means like the 900s, including, includes the reading in a marginal note, added sometime after the original composition. So you can usually tell a marginal note wasn't done by the original guy. Thus, there is no sure evidence of this reading in any Greek manuscript until when? The 1500s. When was this being done? 1522. He's talking about the the, the document. He's going to go into it by Sturica, who's going to hand it to him and say, hey, here it is, but it's probably fraud. It is a fraud. Okay. Each such reading was apparently composed after Erasmus' Greek New Testament was published in 1516. So basically saying it was written after Erasmus began his project, not before. Okay, and this is where he gets into uh, the, the issue we're talking about, the story of how the longer reading was omitted from the first two editions of Erasmus' text, 1516, 1519, but came to be included in his later editions as well known. One of Erasmus' most vocal critics was Stunica, one of the editors of the Complutensian Polyglot, who charged that Erasmus' text lacked the Trinitarian affirmation of 1 John 5, verse 7 to 8, the passage currently under discussion. Erasmus responded that he had not found any Greek manuscript containing these words, but unwisely, as it turned out, promised that if he were shown, shown one, he would insert it. And I found another article uh, on this topic. Where did First uh, John five seven to eight come from? From www.storyofthebible.com, and they they give more uh, details. Erasmus challenged, if you can find one Greek manuscript with this reading, I will include it in my third edition of the Greek, Greek text, or words to those effect. Later, James Lopez Stunica gave Erasmus a Greek manuscript with that reading, the only one ever found to include the phrase. That's the only Greek manuscript that ever had the phrase. Even though the manuscript is dated 1520, which means likely the phrase was inserted in the text as a translation from Latin. So the only thing that makes sense is he he knew, the Stunica knew the Latin from Jerome, and he's going to create a, t a, a phony thing in Greek because that's what Erasmus said. If you give me something in Greek, I'll put it in. If you can give me, a, but he meant a real one. Quote, Erasmus included the phrase in the 1522 edition of his Greek New Testament as if it came from a Greek manuscript. So he, he just, for better or worse, that's what he did. He accepted it. And because Biza at Geneva used the 1522 edition of Erasmus's New Testament to create the 1599 Geneva Bible, this is how it got into the King James Bible, because Geneva is the center of Calvinism, Biza is a Calvinist, so the Calvinist Bible is called the 1599 Geneva Bible. So you've got two editors-in-chief in succession of the King James Bible, or both Calvinists, so they're going to go by Biza. And Biza had it in his Bible, and it's going to end up being in the King James. So that's kind of how it got there. But you can see what happens with Luther. He only had the 1519 edition of Erasmus. And this verse that you and I get to read in English is unknown to Germans and to basically Europeans or anyone who doesn't have an English Bible. So we we got defrauded on the people who, who um, 
speak English. We got a fraudulent version, and the other people got one that was without that fraud. So really, the best you can say about why there's five new words and six deleted from a version of the second sentence, and in the, in the, between seven and eight, obviously someone said, I, I like the, the, the structure of verse eight, and I'm going to just rewrite it so it's exactly speaking of the Trinity, like I would fantasize it should read. And so these were marginal notes, and that meant people were saying, hey, can we interpret it this way? And so they were writing marginal notes, and now it's going to become become a verse. And when that happens, you had to add five new words and you had to delete six. I just want to keep emphasizing so you can see how radically you have to change it. You have to rewrite it with your your dream, what you wish it said, which it doesn't say. And you have to do, you got to do eight, 11 overhauls on one verse to get it to say, to get it to say what you want it to say. And here comes our hero. Yeah, it's about 80, almost 80 years later, 1690. And he basically says, um, you know, some heroic things I like here. He says, uh, there cannot be a better service done to the truth than to purge it of things spurious. And therefore, knowing your prudence, he's writing a person and he's complimenting the person. I, knowing your prudence and calmness of temper, I am confident I shall not offend you by telling you my pl mind plainly, especially since it is no article of faith, no point of discipline, nothing but a criticism concerning a text of scripture, which I'm going to write about. And then, I mean, he's making it sound like it's, you know, it's just not much. And the work he put into it is unbelievable. This man had to be a superior genius, to, you know, and, and, and worked assiduously going from country to country to get all these documents. You, you, you have to, sometimes people should just read something like this and it puts, puts me to shame and people think, you know, you got to, we're so blessed to have the internet, I got to tell you. But he was he was his own internet. He was traveling all over to look at all the papers. Just amazing. Anyway, I want to read this then. For Father, uh, okay, so now he's going to tell us where the marginal notes are. And that's just important because you saw uh, Mr. Harris the third, the professor at theological, Dallas Theological, he's saying, hey, there's all these marginal notes. He goes through these in detail. And, and he not, has extensive knowledge where these marginal notes are. So he's he's on top of it, and he, it's not his day job. He's a scientist. He's a famous scientist. For Father Simon informs us that one of the manuscripts in the Library of King of the King of France marked number two two four seven over against these words. So he's saying he's going to quote a passage, and then over against them is going to be the marginal note, meaning on top, over against these words, and then he tells you what the words are, and they are for. There are three that bear record in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. So that's the real verse. There is this remark, and then it's the, the uh, marginal note. It's a remark. That is the Holy Ghost and the Father and he of himself. So someone is saying to themselves, verse 8 is really talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, and this is, um, okay, so let's continue though. There is a remark, okay, I already did it. And in the same copy, over against these words, and then he's going to tell you what these words are, and it says, it has more words, uh, where it says the three, these three are one, so that's what it says in verse 8 today. Uh, this note is added, and then he reads out the note, and in that, and it says, when it says these three are one, it's, the margin note says that is one deity, one God. All right, so you can see people are putting in margin notes what they think things mean. It's like writing notes in your own Bible. That's all it is. And you're free to do whatever you want, but you can't change the Word of God. You can make your own comments to yourself. Nobody, There's no rule against that. He says this MS, this manuscript, is about 500 years old, which means he's writing in 1611. So he's saying this is from about 1100 A.D., also in the margin of one of the manuscripts in Mons Colbert's library, number 871, look at the precision of this man. As the same father tells us, there is the like remark. So remark means a note, a marginal note. For besides these words, and then he tells us what words they are in Greek, and it's where it says one God, one Godhead, there are added, and then he's going to tell us uh, in Greek, and then he's going to tell us in uh English, it's talking about the testimony of God the Father and, let's go to the next slide, and it continues, of the Holy Ghost. 
these marginal notes sufficiently show how the Greeks used to apply this text to the Trinity, and by consequence, how the author of the disputation is to be understood. Now, remember, these are very late, you know, 1100 and all that. But I should tell you also that the disputation was not writ by Athanasius, somebody who lived in the 300s, but by a later author, and therefore, as a spurious piece, uses not to be uses not to be insisted upon. And it's a little unclear what he's trying to say. I think he says basically you cannot insist on using it because it's specious. You know, it's on a book that maybe the person's trying to look like they're Athanasius or something, or writing in an, uh, something that Athanasius wrote, and then goes on. And besides, this disputation was not writ by Athanasius, okay, so there is sort of a repetition here. It was not writ by Athanasius, but by, but by a later author, and therefore a spurious piece uses not to be much insisted upon. I guess in those days they didn't have word processing, so they kind of just kind of leave it alone, or otherwise they had to rewrite a whole page of stuff. Please bear with me. I, I think you're going to find where this is going is kind of exciting. And the, the genius of this man, I hope I can convey it to you, is amazing to me. So then he's he's going to talk about the, uh, now this mystical application of the spirit, water, and blood to signify the Trinity. So he's basically saying somebody who's seeing these three things that are just spirit, water, and blood, but to them they see a mystical application. It's really talking about the Trinity seems to me have given, gave, given occasion to somebody either fraudulently to insert the testimony of the three in heaven and express words, meaning take your idea that it means the Trinity and you're going to expressly put it into the text for proving the Trinity or else to note it in the margin of his book by way of an interpretation, which would be honest, legitimate, whence it might afterward creep into the text in transcribing. So that's what he's thinking, why people might put it in the note of, of what books aren't just your personal books. These are the books for the church. You shouldn't do that. You should keep them sacred. But they were putting marginal notes to try to influence maybe the next commentator to think that that was what was intended and just put in what, what this person's note said. That could be it. Okay, and the first upon record that inserted it is Jerome. Oh, so now he's hit the person he knows is most responsible for creating this problem. If the preface to the canonical God epistles which pass under his name are his, for whilst he composed not a new translation of the New Testament, but only corrected the ancient vulgar Latin, as learned men think, and amongst his emendations or changes, written perhaps at first in the margin of his book, he inserted this testimony and complains in his, his said preface how he was thereupon accused by some of the Latines, meaning Italians <laughs> or Latin speakers, for falsifying the scripture and makes answer that the former Latin translators, basically, basically the Vulgates of the past, uh, but that means vulgar tongue, the Latin tongue, uh, had much erred from the faith in putting only the spirit, water, and blood in their edition and omitting the testimony of the three in heaven whereby the Catholic faith is established by this defense. He seems to say that he corrected the vulgar Latin translation by the original Greek, and this is the great testimony which the text relies upon. So what he's saying is that the he believes that it, it, it didn't say what he put in there, which was the uh, father word, and spirit and they are one so see he's he's saying that and then he's trying to say but it was he believes they didn't follow what the was earlier texts and newton newton is going to rip him apart about that here's newton on jerome and it gets really really very uh, good but while he confesses, and, and I say this because I was giving uh, Jerome a pass last time, thinking, well, you know, he did try to bring out the Ebionite Matthew, but you know what? He's the one who took out a verse that was clearly in the Bible, this day I begot me. There's just no way. Now I have to conclude, he, based on what I'm reading here from uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, yes, he did that deliberately. So we're going to maybe have to do a little uh, video on that later, but let's find out what he did to 1 John verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 7 first. But while he confesses it was not in the Latin before, so he's saying it, he's, he's admitting it wasn't in the Latin before he fixed it, and accuses former translators of falsifying the scripture and omitting it, so he's claiming they, they screwed up, they, they saw it and they didn't put it in. 
uh, he satisfies us that it has crept into the Latin since his time, and so cuts off all the authority of the present vulgar Latin for justifying it. So he's not claiming it's based on his current uh, Vulgate. So he's saying it was in there before, and this is how he's going to catch uh, Jerome in a lie, because you can disprove that if it doesn't exist at all before, then he lo he lo he's he's just trying to use his uh, Jerome's just trying to use his weight to make you think it's there when it really isn't. It's like a, it's like mirrors, right? And while he was accused by his contemporaries, Jerome was accused by his contemporaries of falsifying the scripture in, ins in inserting this very passage, this accusation also confirms that he altered the public reading. For had the reading without this uh, Father, Word, Holy Ghost been dubious before he made it, so no man would have charged him with falsification for following either part. So in other words, if, if it had been there all along, why would people be accusing him of falsifying this text of this, this specific verse? Also, while upon this accusation, he recommends the alteration by its usefulness for establishing the Catholic faith. So he's saying in reading the preface to the New Testament that Jerome did, Jerome is actually pointing right at this verse and saying, this is, you know, I've been accused of falsifying this, but by the way, this is very useful for establishing our Catholic faith. And he's saying, why would he say that? He's telling you why he lied, he, why he's putting it in there. It's good. It's useful. That, that's irrelevant, Jerome. It doesn't matter whether it's good or useful. It's what's true or not. And you can't put stuff in it that you made up. And so he's catching him. He's catching him by people. People often will say something that will indicate they what why they're doing something and they're justifying it if you if you figure it out this renders it the more suspected by discovering both the design of his making it so so he's saying now that we know why he's doing it that lets us know he he is lying he is the fraudulent party here and the ground of his hoping for success so he sees that this is going to be good even though it's not true it's not real However, seeing he was thus accused by his contemporaries, it gives us just occasion to examine the business between him and his accusers. And so he being called to the bar, we are not to lay stress upon his own testimony for himself, for no man is a witness in his own cause, but laying aside all prejudices, we ought, according to the ordinary rules of justice, to examine the business between him and his accusers by other witnesses. And now he's going to go and he's going to pull in other witnesses to show that Jerome made this thing up. Okay, and here he continues. They that have been con conversant in his writings, Jerome's writings, observe a strange liberty Jerome takes in asserting things. So now he's now he's doing a review of Jerome's quality of writing and thinking. Many notable instances of this he has left us in composing those very fabulous lives of Paul and Hilarion, not to mention what he has written upon other occasions. Once Erasmus said of him that he was in in affirming things frequently violent and impudent and often contrary to himself but i accuse him not it's possible he might be sometimes imposed upon or through inadvertency commits a mistake yet since his contemporaries accused him it's just we should it's just we should lay aside the prejudice of his great name and hear the cause impartially between them so he's asking us hey we got to be fair let's let's do this by the book okay so now the next one now the witnesses between them are partly, and he's going to number out three, so I'm going to I've numbered them so like we can know what he's talking about. Now the witnesses between them are partly these three: the ancient translators of the scriptures into various languages, so that's going to be one set of witnesses against them. Two, partly the writers of his own age and the ages next before and after him. That's witnesses a set of witnesses number two. Three, partly the scribes who have copied out the Greek manuscripts or the scriptures in all ages. And all three are against him. And he's going to then systematically go through and prove that. For by the unanimous evidence of all of these, it will appear that the testimony of the three in heaven was wanting in the Greek manuscripts. This is fraudulent, verse 7. From whence Jerome, or whoever was the author of that preface to the canonical epistles, pretends to have borrowed it. So it's also kind of giving Jerome maybe an out, like maybe he didn't even write the preface. Maybe, you know, so... But uh, we, we know he wrote it, of course. I, I hope, by the way, that the, you, you are enjoying seeing the mind, that this great mind is going through this in a systematic way, leaving no stone unturned to find the culprit who forged something into the Bible because he loves the word. This man is not 
he has he's he's trying to establish what is the word of God and not allow people to change the word of God. And if they do, they get caught because of the uh, the evidence here, this evidence, so that we can have uh, we can safely restore the Bible. And that's actually I think this is why the commentators and most of the Bibles now will either omit this verse or put a, a, a footnote and say it's doubtful. Okay, let's continue. The ancient interpreters, which I cite as witnesses against him, Jerome, are chiefly the authors of the ancient vulgar Latin of the Syriac and the Ethiopic versions. And this is a very good point because these are older than the Italian versions because these, you know, Syria, Ethiopia, these were like in ancient times, the earlier Christians. And then the amount of Italian vulgar in Rome and all of that would have probably not been as uh, old. They would come they become later in time, and th these would be the earliest Christians. For as he tells us that the Latines omitted the testimony of the three in heaven. So he's saying, Jerome's admitted that the Italian versions by on the Italian peninsula, they didn't have it. So now we have to look at these versions uh, from Syria and Ethiopia in their version before his time. So in the Syriac and Ethiopic versions, both of which Walton's account of them are much ancienter than Jerome's time. See, there's a proof of some historian. Being the versions which the Oriental and Ethiopic nations received from the beginning and generally used as the Latines did, the vulgar Latin, that that, that testimony is wanting to this day, meaning they don't, they don't have any evidence of verse 7 either. And the authors of these three most ancient, most famous, and most received versions by omitting it Let's see what it says next. By omitting it, our concurrent witnesses that they found it wanting in the original Greek manuscripts of their times. His wanting also, so I guess he's talking about the Ethiopic and um, Syrian and Greek manuscripts. So I thought he was talking about Latin, but anyway, it's the same difference. These are earlier Christians than the Italian Peninsula Christians. All right, so he's saying it's missing in these Ethiopic, Ethiopic and Syrian manuscripts too, and they're earlier in time. Next, it's going to say, "'Tis wanting also in other ancient versions, as in the Egyptian Arabic, published in Walton's Polyglot, in the Armenian, in the, Ar oh, and then he's saying, in the Armenian used ever since Chrysostom's age by the Armenian nations, and in the Illyricum in the, of Cyrillus used in Russia, I think is Russia, I'm not sure, Bulgaria, Moldavia, Russia, Muscovy, and other countries which use the Slavonic tongue. I mean, can you see how extensive his knowledge is? He, he apparently has researched all this stuff. It just it boggles the mind. In a copy of this version printed at Ostrobe in Volcania in the year 1581, I've seen it wanting. He, he's actually seen this book. Can you believe this? How did he get this? He must have traveled to Ostrobe in Volcania. And one Camillus relates the same thing out of ancient manuscripts of this version seen by him. Father Simon notes it wanting, let's see what the next slide says, wanting also in a certain version of the French church, which says he is at least a thousand years old. Well, this is 1611. He's saying it's from the 600s, and which was published by Mabillion, a Benedictine monk. Nor do I know of any version wherein its extent, except the modern vulgar Latin in such modern versions. So he said, the only thing I know is the modern vulgar latin it's this version uh that comes from just jerome uh, of the western nations has been influenced by it so then by the unanimous consent of all the ancient and faithful interpreters we have hitherto met with who doubtless made use of the best manuscripts they could get the testimony of the three in heaven was not anciently in the greek and that's, by the way, you're, you, when we were, uh, Professor Harris was talking about it, the Dallas theological teacher. That's what he said too, right? Where did he get it from? Maybe he read this piece by, uh, or or whoever he studied from had studied uh, Sir Isaac Newton's words and his sources. Okay, this the story gets better, so don't don't think uh, don't jump away just yet. <laughs> And that it was neither in the ancient versions nor in the Greek, but was wholly unknown to the first churches is most certain by an argument hinted above. And this is important. Namely, that in all the vehement, universal, and lasting controversy about the Trinity in Jerome's time and both before and long enough after it, this text of the three in heaven was never thought of. Tis now in everybody's mouth and accounted the main text for the business, basically proving the Trinity. 
and would have been so had so then had it been in their books and yet it is not once to be met with in all of the disputes epistles orations and other writings of the greeks and latines and then get this he's going to now list every source that he's aware of which means this man has an encyclopedic memory and he reads all these things so listen to what he cites as all the proof that he knows doesn't have this reference of to to verse 7 the alexander of alexandria athanasius the council of sardica and go to the next slide continuing basil naziazin nizin epiphanius chrysostom cyril theodoret hilary ambrose austin victorinus afer philastrius brixianus fabadius Fab 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 i can't say all these things gregorius batakis faustinus diaconus pascasius arnobius jr surrealis and others in the time of those controversies so he's saying look, look at all these people i'm familiar with all of them and i'm telling you they've never said anything about this verse and wouldn't they have used it to win their debates or make a point because because it's what it says father word holy spirit and these three are one you win the case it's right there why wouldn't they use it perfect argument a conclusive killer no not in jerome himself is the is if his version and preface to the canonical epistles be accepted the writings of those times were very many and copious and there was no argument or text of scripture to this purpose which they did not urge again and again he's saying hey they used every other verse they could find why wouldn't they use this if it were there because it's not there that's his point and this next passage could be just written today that of john's gospel it says i and the father are one and one is everywhere inculcated but this of the three in heaven and there being one is nowhere to be met with till at length when the ignorant ages come on began by degrees to creep into the latin copies out of jerome's version so far are they from citing the testimony of the three in heaven that on the contrary as often as they have occasion to mention the place they omit it and that as well after jerome's age as in or before it i'm not quite sure what he was trying to say but i think he's saying you know they had all these opportunities to cite this and they never did so th that's how he knows it didn't exist i promise to show you what people will argue on the other side i respect this man david daniels he did a great video on the Sinaiticus. um but you know did he study this as well as uh, sir isaac newton i'm going to tell you i don't think anybody could i mean you just saw the most brilliant homework done on any topic you can imagine but anyway, his answer is yes, this belongs in the Bible. 1 John 5, 7 belongs in the King James Bible and was preserved by faithful Christians. But the passage was removed from many Greek manuscripts because of the problem it seems to cause. No, what did we learn? It's in no Greek manuscript, not one. Now he's going to use an uh, argument, which is the early writers will quote the three is one. But remember, that's in verse eight anyway. So you can't do that. And remember in the old days they didn't have verse numbers so if he's referring to something you could very easily think he's talking about your verse because whoever designed the father word uh spirit verse was taking advantage of the fact that there's similarities because the other verse says the word spirit and blood and water and they are one it actually says they are one not they're in agreement it says they are one sometimes they change it to be agreement but that but you see that's how Jerome quoted it as saying they are one, okay, in, in what's verse 8. So anyway, let me re show you the next page to see my point. Okay, so he cites Tertullian writing in 200 AD. He wrote which three are one based on the verse in his against praxis. So he's jumping to a conclusion that because it sounds just like verse 7, just those words alone doesn't do it because those are also in verse 8, even though somewhat mistranslated these days to be, and they were in agreement no they were one two as well 250 and again of the father son and holy ghost it is written and the three are one well but you notice they didn't quote the words father son and holy ghost inside the verse they said the father son and holy ghost are spoken of as there the three are one but that's in verse eight the, 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 the that phrase and people were interpreting that phrase verse 8 to have that meaning so that doesn't help Priscillian refer and this is all in I, I didn't make this up this is in uh, I didn't quote you everything that uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton said he, he goes through this too because the same argument was he was uh, he was addressing an anticipated argument 
And the next one, it doesn't even tell you what they said. Same thing, it doesn't tell you what it says. It's just referred to. So if you're using this loose way of understanding what's going on here and don't pay attention to the fact they don't use verse numbers and they use the same language that's in verse 8, they use in verse 7. And that's probably why they wrote verse 7 to be a, little, a lot like verse 8, okay? Athanasius referred to it, and probably just verse 8. Aurelius Augustine used it. Hmm? Again, because what 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 um, Sir Isaac Newton proves is that people were using verse 8, even as it spoke of the blood, the blood, the spirit, and the water, they were using that to say, this is really about the Trinity. So you can get easily confused if you're not paying attention, and that's exactly what... Uh, Sir Isaac Newton went through, he said, look at all these people arguing this, but you could see there was this impetus or desire to try to use this verse by interpretation to be about the Trinity, but only until Jerome pushed it over the edge into actually saying it was the Trinity of the Father, the, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. That's when it passed from just being an interpretation. Now it became part of the Bible, then it became part of the King James, and so on. So again, if you just keep reading, it's the same thing on and on. So he's 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 not wrong in the sense that he's honest these are the words that are on the page they sound just like seven but he's he he but they also sound just like eight and their interpretations not actually quoting and he doesn't even ever try to quote you so you could could really understand that and the one time he did it's very clear under 250 cyprian cyprian is saying and again of the father son and holy ghost it is written and the three are one. And it didn't say the Father, the Word, and Spirit. That would have been a quote, possibly, but this actually doesn't follow that, you see. So it's not those words, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are an interpretation overlaid on top of the three or one, you see. So he's jumping to conclusion, I believe, and, uh, you know, people, reasonable minds can differ. So I'm not saying he's being dishonest, but he could be misled by his own desire to justify this. So I hope if he were to see this video, he seems like a very intelligent person. I think he would see the evidence is overwhelming. And and if you think I'm wrong, please go look. I gave you the references at the bottom of the page to uh, to find the, um, I, I, I captured the URL where the uh, two pages, there's just two two web pages that contain the entirety of Sir Isaac Newton's arguments. And they're brilliant and they're just fun to read. He's just amazing. Okay, it's this got one kind of long, sorry, but I think you, you, you uh, hopefully enjoyed it. And uh, God bless. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed this and take care. God bless. Ciao.